Humankind has come a long way on its journey to where it is today. From the primordial waters of our earliest existence to the many great discoveries and inventions along the way. The harnessing of fire, agriculture, society, nuclear annihilation and perhaps most importantly of all, video games. And now comes a video game about exactly that. Amplitude Studios' own Humankind, a game that I've been very excited for and that's here to give the Civilization series a proper run for its money. But if there was a word that I could use to describe exactly what the Humankind experience is, it's... Eh. Don't get me wrong or anything, the game's pretty fun and all, but I won't pretend that I wasn't expecting more from it. It's got a lot of good ideas, but many of them are shallow or almost feel like they're separate from the core of the gameplay entirely. And along with a bit of lack of polish, one can't help but feel that this game was released a little earlier than it should have been. But hey, it's not like that's the state of the entire modern games industry or anything. <laughs> I hate capitalism, I hate capitalism, I hate capitalism. So you know what? No more Mr. Nice Wood, but today I'm being mean. It's time to be unkind to humankind. Much like many 4X strategy games, the goal of humankind is to win. The way you do this is by collecting the most fame points of any of the competing empires, which you'll earn through completing era objectives, building cultural wonders, and other general deeds that you can accomplish throughout human history. Humankind's big selling point is that you don't play as a fixed civilization. You'll initially start as a nomadic tribe before you settle down and choose a civilization to play as in the ancient era, before choosing a new one once you progress into the next era and so forth. Each civilization has one of seven affinities, either builder, estate, expansionist, agrarian, merchant, scientist or militarist, which will earn you extra fame for completing their associated era objectives and will provide you with a special ability. And each individual civ also comes with their own emblematic district, unit and bonus ability. However, rather than choosing a new civilization upon aging up, you can also choose to transcend your culture to the next era which will provide bonus fame for completing era objectives at the cost of not receiving a new passive bonus for your civilization. If you're familiar with the Civilization series, then you'll be relatively familiar with Humankind from the get-go. If you're gonna liken this game to any particular title, I guess you'd probably say Civ 6, largely due to the game's city quarter building mechanics, very similar to the districts from Civ 6. The technology tree is straight out of a Civ game, unit movement works in a very similar way, and one of the more important resources you'll accumulate is influence, which draws some parallels to culture in the Civilization series and is used to both build new outposts to claim territory and enact civics. It's cool to watch your cities grow from small little urban centres to vast sprawling metropolises by the end of the game and there's a good amount of strategy involved when it comes to clever district placement and city settling and you'll need to be able to make sure to secure luxuries, amenities and not to overextend too quickly to keep them stable. Now, I know I promised you that I was going to be mean to this game, and that will come, have patience you little shit, but first, there are some things that I do like about it. Being able to choose a new civilization each era is a unique mechanic, and probably the biggest selling point of the game, and I think it's nice. It allows you to choose a specific focus not only for the entire game, but for each era individually, and the bonuses that come with each civilization allow you to shape a totally unique culture by the end of each game. I think that the way that era progression is tied to progress stars rather than technology is also cool, and I like that it doesn't force you into choosing a new era straight away. In fact, sometimes it's it's worth sticking around and earning a few more stars before aging up at the risk of someone else getting there first and pinching the sieve that you wanted to get. I also really like how the map has different elevation levels rather than just tiles that are considered hills or mountains. It makes the map not only look more appealing but adds a lot to the strategy of the game, particularly when it comes to settlement placement and unit formation in combat. The combat in general is far more interesting than the Civilization series as well, and I liked how it created the little battlefield zones where all units are deployed and the battles can span several turns if not resolved in less than three rounds. City sieges are also much cooler than the Civilization series and they're more realistic. You can actually wait out sieges and build up siege equipment, or just rush straight in if you have enough of an advantage. The way that the map is split up into different territories, somewhat reminiscent of the province map in a game like EU4, is also cool and how territories are claimed also feels a little more natural than just instantly spawning a city out of nothing with the settler. 
And not every territory has to be assigned to a city either, they can be attached as an extra territory to expand your borders without creating more cities, which is often necessary due to you receiving a large influence penalty if you go over your city cap. I do feel however that the city cap is too restrictive and should scale with larger size maps because it really hampers your expansion in the early game especially. Speaking of things I don't like so much about the game, let's get into that shall we? One deviation of a mechanic from the Civilization series that I don't like is how wonders work. Rather than simply unlocking them through technology and being able to queue them up for production, you can just spend influence to claim a specific wonder. Only you can build that wonder once you've claimed it, and you have to build that wonder before you can claim another. While sure, it stops you from just spamming wonders, it means that you can just claim a wonder and then build it when you're ready to. There's no risk aspect to it. You can't get within a few turns of building a wonder before someone snatches it off you. It takes away a huge amount of the strategy associated with building them, and I think is a much worse system in general. Not to mention that wonders didn't really seem that good and they take up a lot of production time. Same with how civics take up a whole load of influence and give you fairly meager bonuses and only slightly move your ideology axes which are more commonly moved by random pop-up events anyway. I often didn't bother with many civics and spent all my influence on expanding instead. Except for the uh nuclear proliferation one of course. And then there's religion, and I don't know if I've ever seen a more half-baked backseat mechanic in my life. I would just forget it existed until I got to unlock a new tenant. The tenant bonuses were so meager, and having a dominant religion made almost no noticeable impact on the game. Honestly, focusing on religion was almost as pointless as it is in real life. Am I right, my fellow r slash atheism enjoyers? And on the theme of half-baked ideas, I really like the concept behind the ideal logical axes of your country and how they're shaped by civics and events, but I would have liked to have seen more involvement from them, especially when it came to diplomacy and relations between other major empires, rather than just your affinity with independent peoples. It also feels like there's a bit of a lack of civs in the game too, especially when some eras have no civs of a certain affinity. Come on, only 10 per era? You could definitely have more. Why is there no Bosnia Civ? Why isn't there an ancient Hyperborean Finnish Empire Civ? And where the frick is my dang Wooper Civ? Like this video if you support a Wooper Ethnostate. As there are no historical leaders in the game due to how civilizations flip all the time, there's just a bunch of preset leaders, all with their own specific personalities and bonuses, some more annoying to play against than others. You have to choose which AI you play against manually though, which is perplexing. Could there really not have been an option to choose the AI randomly? I also would have liked to have seen maybe a random AI personality generator to add more variety rather than just coming up against the same generic AI every single time. Also, fix their fucking facial animations, please. Balance is an important part of competitive strategy games, especially one like this that's premises around its dynamic playstyle, and unfortunately for humankind, it's more than a little wonky. Playstyles in this game are not all equal. Certain affinities are just far more achievable, especially in the early eras. I feel that in general the easiest stars to attain are the agrarian, builder and scientist stars, and having high population, production and science make it much easier to be a more powerful nation in general. The worst civs are the expansionist ones, especially in the early game, because you need an obscenely high amount of territories to get more than one star per era for it, and your influence gain is massively hampered by the very restrictive city limit. And detaching a huge amount of territories to one city leaves the territories underdeveloped and the city bustling with instability. Just don't fucking pick the expansionist civs, okay? Certain civs also have bonuses that are just clearly better or worse than others. I hope nobody who lives in the Balkans is watching this because the Turks have to be probably one of the most overpowered civs in the game. Because their emblematic district, the public school, is completely broken. Look at this shit. It genuinely quintupled my science output in like 10 turns. I completed the tech tree with like 50 turns to spare. Just, just let me show you the timeline to give you an idea. Now, now, if you follow standard insertion procedures, everything will be fine. Get away from me. Shut it down. No. Attempt to shut it down. It's not. It's not. It's not shutting down. It's, it's not. 
And don't even get me started on unit upgrade costs. This shit is horrendously expensive and it just gets more and more expensive the further in you get, despite the gap between unit upgrades getting shorter and shorter. Unless you focus on just making shitloads of money, it's almost easier to disband and reproduce units rather than spending all your cash upgrading them. And then there's the AI, which... Well, it's, it's interesting at times, especially when it comes to conflict. Not too dissimilar to the Civ games, especially Civ 6 on launch, they have a bit of a habit of declaring pointless wars they're clearly not going to win, and have some questionable tactics in Battle 2. I also found that there's a big gap between how good the AI are between Nation and Empire difficulty. On Nation, I totally stomped the game with more than double the fame of the AI that came second, but on Empire, the AI is clearly just getting massive bonuses to help them out. In the game I played on Empire, I was dowed early on by my neighbour who was constantly outputting 4 stack armies to attempt to siege my cities, albeit unsuccessfully. After I finally pushed them back and won the war, I found out they only had one city. There's no way they could have been outputting that many units legitimately, even if hiring them from an independent nation. Another big issue I have with the AI is that much like the AI in the Civilization series, they often don't bother trying to do anything to stop you or whoever it is that is clearly running away with the game. Although to be fair to them, in humankind, there isn't all that much you can do. The biggest issue that I have with the game is that the end game feels almost non-existent. Unlike in Civ games where usually the game becomes super spicy once you get to the modern eras, in humankind once you get to the good parts of the contemporary era, the game is pretty much done. The game is ended by a number of criteria, either the turn timer running out which is dependent on what speed you're playing on, a player earning every contemporary era star, a player completing the tech tree, a player eliminating and or vassalizing all other empires, a player completing the Mars mission, or the Earth succumbing to climate change, probably at the hands of the Australians. You can choose presets for ending criteria, though you can't choose to turn each criteria on or off individually, which I thought was pretty stupid. If there was one criteria I'd choose to turn off, it'd be the turn timer one, and it's on in all of the presets you can choose. The issue is that the good stuff like nukes and the technologies that allow you to make big plays are usually only achieved moments before one of these criteria is met, meaning that you've got little time to do anything that's really big, and it's usually all for naught anyway, because even if you totally cripple the leading player, if there's only five turns left, they'll probably just win anyway. And this ties into why I don't really like the fame system when compared to the victory conditions in a game like Civilization. If someone's about to build a spaceship or win a cultural victory, nuke their capital, invade the shit out of them. In Civilization, there's much more ability to actually stop someone who is clearly running away with the game. In Humankind, there really isn't much of a way to make those big impact plays. Hell, if you send the rocket to Mars and you're not leading in fame, you'll just fucking lose. Oftentimes, I found myself far ahead of the AI in fame, and I honestly could have just AFK'd the contemporary era and still won. And don't get me wrong, nukes have a big impact in this game. They'll just straight up destroy an entire city, wipe it off the map. But when that happens five turns before the game ends, it's kinda... Eh, shit happens. Really, the only way to beat the leading player would be to wipe them out completely, requiring either a massive nuclear stockpile, which is realistically unachievable before the game ends, or the ability to completely conquer them, also realistically unachievable due to city cap penalties and the fact that you really can't take that much in peace deals. I get that the fame system encourages you to choose a specific focus and that it rewards you for playing well earlier on, but the game lacks that big crescendo that a game where there can be only one winner left standing should have. And rather than having a much more dynamic and interesting finish, each game feels like it just kind of fizzles out. Aesthetically, I do like the game. It's almost sort of in between the look of Civ 5 and Civ 6, certainly at least for the leader models, but the map itself looks pretty good and the UI surrounding it is pretty intuitive for the most part. One section of the UI that I think needs to be overhauled, however, is the peace deal UI. Amplitude could take a page out of the Paradox Grand Strategy book here and not make it take up the whole screen, and also allow you to click on the map to choose which territories you take, rather than having to memorize them and then choose them from the narrow drop-down list. I don't mind the narrator either, he's got the right kind of stoic sounding voice, but basically everything he says is tongue in cheek, which wasn't so bad the first time around, but when you have to hear the same shitty jokes every single time you play through the game, it starts to get more than a little mildly annoying. 
Polish is also a bit of an issue. I'd hardly say the game is Bethesda-esque when it comes to bugs, but they're still relatively prevalent. Units forgetting to animate and getting stuck during combat, dead empires reappearing for diplomacy when continuing after finishing the game, the game getting stuck after completing a turn which forces a reload, and surely those grid lines around mushroom clouds aren't meant to be there, right? Amplitude also clearly tried, but the main theme music isn't anywhere near Civ level either. To be fair, you're competing with tracks like Sonio di Volare and arguably the greatest theme music of all time, Baba Yetu from Civ 4, so it was never really a contest. You should have just hired Christopher Tin. Overall, I won't say that Humankind is a bad game by any means, but I also won't say that it didn't underwhelm me. Maybe it's my fault for getting excited for it, but the game really feels a little half-baked, something becoming more and more prevalent in modern game development. To be fair, I still had a fair amount of fun with it, and that is largely down to it being simply a genre of game that I like. And to give credit to Amplitude Studios where it's due, I applaud them for trying some new things and not just serving up a straight Civ clone. And don't forget what Civ 5 and Civ 6 were like on launch, they weren't exactly gems either. But should you buy Humankind? Well, if you already have Civ 5 or Civ 6 with all their DLC, wait for it to go on sale first. If you don't have any DLC for either, then it's probably worth a look. I feel like Humankind may well go down that same path where a few DLC expansions could take it that further step forward, make it feel a little less bare bones in some aspects, and perhaps extend the end game out a little more. But on the same note of DLC, what I can appreciate about the game is that it is giving Civilization some proper competition. So maybe their DLC model might not be as freakish as it currently is when Civ 7 comes knocking. But for now, Humankind, if I'm to be brutally honest, I'm afraid that the Civilization series has earned itself a few more fame points than you have.